Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and Design Deducts podcast. Our guest today is Richard Adams. Welcome, Richard. Hello there, and hello to anyone listening. Um, I'm rather pleased to be asked. Thank you. Oh, fantastic to have you. So tell us, tell us a little bit about you and your work. Uh, well... It's very difficult, and I'll try and do it very quickly, but I've had a split career where I've spent, well, it's just, I don't really want to labor the point either, but I have spent about half my career in education and about half of it in deep emerging technology. Um, And although I'm working in technology, my uh, degrees and everything are in fine art and sort of around... Uh, one of the reasons I got into computing, and this was a long time ago, 25, 26, mm-hmm. 7 years ago, actually 30 years ago, was to make art with computers. And um, it was extremely difficult at the time. There was virtually no software. The, the web didn't really exist. The internet was there. Uh, and there was no examples, to be honest. There was very little in the way of um, digital culture. There was no digital culture, but there was computational art culture. Um, and it was very, very difficult. And it, because then in the early 90s, the technology sector as we now know it sort of kicked off, I was very lucky and in the right place at the right time to be able to take advantage of the fact that basically I'd learned to program and uh, I was an art graduate. And there were very few of us around in London at that point who were literally with that mix. And so my career since has been that exactly that mix. Uh, and I have to say, just before that, I was actually an art and music teacher uh, in a school. So what I've done over the years is jump between education and sort of technology jobs. Hmm. The technology jobs have all been about new things. It's either emerging technology or new applications or whatever. And, and that's because that's what I'm interested in. I think that's where the art and design background kicks in. Mm-hmm. I understand automatically, um, sort of hardwired, really, uh, to make new things. Brilliant. And I get really bored with business as usual jobs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't stand them. <laughs> but, um, you know, in terms of education, seen as this is an education thing, obviously I was a school teacher for a few years. And then um, I founded a university digital arts department in the 90s. Um, created two digital arts degrees, two master's degrees in computer arts and an MMUS composing for new media and games. It was the world's first composition for games, master's degree for classical musicians. Um, And then I went went into the dot-com boom and um, in jobs, but I carried on as a visiting professor and external examiner and all of those sorts of roles typically that, 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 that people get, um, and taught occasionally. So I ended up teaching classes at Birkbeck College in digital creativity to business students because I could do them in the evening. Um, and more recently, well, I say recently, 10 years ago, with you know, I helped Mark Lewis get the School of Communication Arts off the ground, which I think is a groundbreaking institution in, lo- in lots of ways. Um, and... Since then, I've kept involved with education in different ways. Now, currently chair of trustees of an international education charity, Professors Without Borders. Um, but at the same time, during the day, I'm designing emergent technology systems. So there you go. And making the art that you can see on the wall behind me. Oh, fantastic. So this is, this is the project you're currently working on from, from, the, from, that, from an art perspective? This is the main art project I'm working mm-hmm. on at the mm-hmm. moment. Uh, I started calling them haunted selfies, but actually they're anti-selfies. Um, I, I was extremely ill uh, a while ago, and I, I was sort of in hospital, and I was trying to sort of stop getting incredibly down about it. And one of the things I thought, well, how do you not get down about it? And I thought, well, I always am happiest when I'm making things. And unfortunately, when you're in hospital, you can't get, um, you can't take paints and things like that into a hospital because it makes the bed filthy. Um, But I did have, obviously, this Surface Pro and my mobile phone. And while I was sat there sort of doodling, if you like, in there, uh, because prior to that, I've been doing a lot of photography, I started to sort of read people's social media feeds and, and sort of look at it and be, you, you sort of detach yourself, I think, 
Mm-hmm. And I started to look at it in a very detached way and began to realize actually it's an incredibly narcissistic culture. And that in terms of popular culture in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you had music. In the 90s, sort of an early 2000s, games exploded. But actually, in the last 10 years, the biggest explosion in popular culture has been selfie culture from the Kardashians to TikTok. You know, it's all about the self, it's all about showing off, and it's incredibly narcissistic. And there seems to be, it seems to be a very binary culture. You either explore your misery in depth and tell everyone how bad you are at things, or you completely curate your own life. And either way, it doesn't help people. Mm. But what I was seeing more and more of was the people who were making things look fantastic. You know, their, their swimming pool at their villa or or, um, you know, this and the other. And I know, you know, I knew at the time they were having marital trouble and things like this. So it was odd that there was this disconnect between incredibly happy stuff and incredibly bad stuff. And so what I did was I was thinking one day about the music side of uh, what I do, because I, I do write music and put it on Spotify and all the streaming services. And I was looking at a piece of art by someone who takes music files compresses them into mp3 and removes what's left and keeps the stuff that is cut out by mp3 compression and uses that as music files and it struck me that what people were doing was with selfie culture was exactly the same thing they were cutting out everything they didn't need compressing what was there and just leaving the good bit if you like the tune down the middle and so it occurred to me, well, why not do the other bits that are being cut out? So actually, what are you cutting out? You're cutting out angst. You're cutting out terror. You're cutting out waking up at three in the morning. You're cutting out anger. All of that sort of thing in selfie culture. And I, I've started to put that on these paintings. And, and because I was in hospital, I couldn't work with paint. So I used the Surface Pro. So I did some hand drawings of myself. I took some photographs. I wrote a piece of code or downloaded and modified some code that moved pixels around, and then I painted in using paint packages mm-hmm. uh, and produced these things, which I put on canvas and then frame in a uh, very, very kitsch sort of old-fashioned frames with fake things like fake woodworm holes in. And that's all about simulacra. I wanted the work to immediately be like paintings, even though it was computational and digital and the product of selfie culture. And so I'm revisiting European expressionism via selfie culture, and these are the anti-selfies. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, I had nothing else to do, so uh, that... Uh, <laughs> so, so now this experience, you continue now with the, this work? Yeah, it's going on, and I'm, I'm sort of pondering how to sort of take it to the next level, really, because actually it's been quite interesting. Mm-hmm. I think when people see these online... They don't quite get the impact that you do when you see them actually on the walls. Um, And particularly when you lay them out in exhibition and this. And I've not had many exhibitions of it. And and people don't know what to make of it because it's computational, yet it looks like a painting. And I've had all sorts of odd discussions. Yeah, it's just... Like a digital exhibition with them so that people can see... No, well, I don't don't think think that's the point of them. Mm, mm, I think... mm point of them is that they have i went back to that notion of, that baudrillard talked about where he talked about simulacra mm. and and i felt they had to be simulacra of paintings and therefore if they were simulacra they had to exist in a real painting environment which was a real gallery and which is why i framed them um and they look great on a screen but they look incredibly different and more powerful when you see them framed and hung uh, and that's the thing that got through to me when I saw people come in to look at them. Um, the difference in responses, you know, I had people walking up and saying, uh, not not one here, but, you know, I had a guy come up and say, that's how I felt when my son died. Wow. And you can't get that from the digital version, to be honest. Um, you can only get it from the fact it's been put in a context in which people can read it. And this is important for design and art in general. Mm -hmm. If you don't manipulate that context, the context in which it's being perceived, then people can't read it in the way you want them to read it. And this is why it's important to exhibit it, but I won't exhibit it massively, but just occasionally show some of these things. How do I move on with it? Um, 
Well, it's very difficult. I've got a cho- choice of two routes, really. One is I can go down the, what I would call the conventional computer art route, and I can start exploring heavy computation on images in some way. Or I might go further and explore the simulacra in some way. Now, I did think at one point for that side that what I ought to do is get some of these faces made into silicon masks, for instance, and bring them into reality, 3D. And at the same time, I thought, could I make them actually on screens but framed that read how people are looking at them? Because you can tell facial emotions and blood pressure and all of that from cameras. Uh, And could I make the image then change depending how people feel when they look at it. And I mean over time. So if you put an exhibition on for two weeks and a few hundred people come past, by the end of the two weeks, the painting is looking really miserable Mm. or it's looking happier. You know, I don't know. And I've been thinking about those sorts of things. Uh, But I, I don't know which way to go. It's quite difficult to make those decisions because once you commit, there's a lot of work ahead. Absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm very interested in your in your uh, education teaching background uh, because mm. you co-created uh, that very famous school in London. Uh, mm-hmm. Could you tell us a bit more about that side of of, uh, of your of your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a. I did what everybody else did when they graduated in fine art. You know, I went and did a PGCE teaching year <laughs> because you got extra money for another year. Um, but I was extremely lucky in that. I went to a a place that was at the time called Birmingham Polytechnic, which I think is, uh, I forget what its name is now. It's uh, Birmingham City University, it's now called. But they had a beautiful um, Victorian Gothic art school building in central Birmingham. Beautiful, like the Houses of Parliament and sort of very ornate and huge archways and things. And in there was a PGCE run by uh, a man called Arthur Hughes. And Arthur was a a guy who'd who'd been chair of the British National Society of Education through Art and Design. And he was was a gifted teacher. Uh, And I remember I had an exchange with him early on where, uh, me being me, he just insulted him and he said, right, I'm going to get you for that. And what he did was he he took me under his wing and I I was the only person he actually tutored that year because he'd moved up to head of department. So he oversaw my teaching practice and all of that sort of stuff. He put me in with friends who he knew would challenge me. Um, Rassable guy uh, called George Jackson, who I finished a lesson when I was on teaching practice. And he said, come in the office. And at the time, you could smoke still in buildings. So he had this little glass office that was just smoke. Uh, And (laughs) you couldn't see through the windows. And he, he, uh, he, um, he said, come on in here. And he sat down and he was <laughs> smoking away. And he said, what did you think of that lesson? How did that go? And I said, well, you know, it was okay. And, then, and he said, oh, no, no, no. He said it was bollocks, wasn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and I looked at him and I looked and I remember to this day thinking about this while he looked. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, actually it was. He said, good, being a good teacher, you've admitted it was bollocks. And he had, I think... Arthur was very wise putting me in in with someone that strong, but who was also that fair. Mm. You know, he wasn't putting me down. He was just getting me to admit that I'd done a a rubbish lesson. And um, I can't remember what I was doing at the time. What was I doing? Uh, I think I was trying to teach 12-year-old cubism. So it was all going all over the place. Uh, Well, you know, why not be ambitious? And uh, challenging. Well, it was an interesting way of doing it. I could do it really well now because I did it as – I tried to do it as – pop-up books to bring cubism to life um but he put me with that and so i had arthur running me through this year and in another teaching practice i'd asked the children to paint a landscape from the window because we were in a tower block and there was very long distance you know scenery and views uh and this boy had painted this painting in the top corner of the paper and I kept saying to him, fill the paper. I want you to fill the paper. And he said, I can't. I've done everything I can see. And Arthur was watching me. And he said, do you mind? And I said, no, go ahead. And he went over to the kid and he said, what's the problem? And the kid said, well, he wants me to fill the paper. but I've done everything I can see. Look, he said, right, give me the paper. And he tore all the spare paper off, you know, and handed the kid back the painting and said, now give it him and tell him you filled the paper. 
And again, that was another single lesson that I got from Arthur that was absolutely nail on the head. So I had, I was very, very lucky going to this place where I had teachers who were teaching me to teach who understood me. And it, when I went to my first teaching job, of course, I was quite happy to sort of think, right, okay, that's not working. Let's tear that lesson up and start again in the middle of a lesson. Mm. You know, and I had the confidence to do that. And that's driven me in education all the way through. I've never been scared to stop a lesson 20 minutes in and start again. And I don't think teachers do this enough, but it's actually what we as artists do all the time. Absolutely. And this is where I think there are some disconnects between uh, the educational side of our business and the practice side of our business, you know, in the sense that I can understand why they do that because they're measured, assessed, all of that sort of stuff as they go through lessons. But a fundamental tenet of teaching to me and education in a more wider sense is to be able to stop when you realize you're wrong Mm -hmm. or when you need to change course. And so I've done the same thing, but after a few years there, I got a little bit bored, went to industry, but then I got bored again and came back and went to a university. And I was very lucky. It was at the point where, you know, universities were starting to set up digital arts courses and things. So I I came from a job where in 1994, I'd been making interactive television programs, which is pretty advanced stuff now even, let alone back then with really, really cutting edge technology and difficult technology. Um, And I went to the London College of Music, uh, which was part of a university. And I was in a a department where the music side and the art side was together. And I had a full blank canvas to build digital art stuff. And I built it all on that notion of fail fast. I didn't know it was called agile, by the way, at the time. But uh, it, to me, it was just art practice. You try something, if it's not working, move on, you know, and, and and all of that. And I built it entirely on that. I did the paperwork, you know, got the courses written, all of that sort of stuff. But actually, what I delivered was quite different. <laughs> but every single student, I think, got something immense out of that. And we got creativity out of that. And uh, I remember a colleague saying she'd never seen work of that quality coming out of the students in that place. And it was really... I think, down to just teaching them, even with limited technology, to just try, fail, try, Mm -hmm. fail, try, fail, think, try, fail, think. And it was all of that. And I think that's gone through with me all the way. So when I met Mark Lewis, who was trying to set up the School of Communication Arts, then a few years later, um, we met via Twitter. Um, When Twitter was good and not a bear pit, um, he was looking for someone who was a, a proper qualified teacher and this and the other, but didn't think like most proper teachers he'd met thought. Weren't, wasn't constrained by, you know, the, the limits that are artificially imposed. And I'm not because I work with emerging technologies and often there are no limits mm-hmm. with emerging technologies. You literally have sometimes got no examples to look at. You know, and when you think, well, what sort of system do I need to put in to do this job? any one of a million you know so how do you make those decisions so it's very open-ended quite i know people think um competing in technology is quite convergent but actually at the innovations well at the um yeah the innovation end it's actually quite divergent and so i had a mixture of this divergence both in tech and art and in education where i diverged often breaking the rules um and so he asked me to set that up, and I helped him. Uh, you know, I wrote the first curricula and all of that sort of stuff. We wanted to get it through some accreditation. We wikified in, in 2010 or nine or whenever it was, 2010, we built an entire curriculum on a wiki. Uh, and the, com- the commitment there to the exam board was that the students would modify the curriculum as they went. Mm-hmm. So it was a truly wikified, you know, curriculum. But that, that was used just to get to the point where he is now with the school, where he's running off fully off live briefs and things. So it was a starting phase in a sense. But boy, God, did we have some trouble with the establishment. Um, you know, we had people uh, trying to stop us opening it. We were in London design schools because it was focused around advertising. Um, we know of at least one school where the head of that school went into the exam board and said, 
you can't accredit them because we're the design advertising school in London and things like this. I had a, a woman ring me up and berate me for 30 minutes. I don't know where she got my number from. Um, you know, that, that once I got my uh, surprise back, I, um, you know, I told her we wouldn't, you know, I don't know why she was bothered because she'd never get a job there because we didn't want to employ <laughs> teachers like her, you know. Uh, and Mark had some quite interesting interactions at conferences where he went to announce all this. Um, and Mark didn't look like, you know, he wears trousers made of X curtains and things like this. So, I, I know. Uh, yeah, well, you've met him, but, but, um, but, you know, so that was about wikifying it, but that was about building a, a college, a unit that was literally an integrated sort of layer in with industry because it was focused on industry. Mm. Whereas I think most colleges will do courses here and see industry here. We did that. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and it was extremely hard. And I don't know whether you could do something like that on a, on a larger scale. I noticed that most of the other um, very innovative places tend to be relatively small. And I, I wonder if that's because you lose touch. It's like an empire growing and you lose sort of touch with the, with the sort of edges of the empire um, or not, because that whole thing was not about telling them how to do or what to do something. It was about how to approach doing something. So, you know, the word why with a question mark was used all over the place. And this, in fact, last time I went in, I noticed it was still on the walls. You know, why am I being asked to do this? Why does he want it? Why does she want this? Why, is it, why are these limits being imposed? And understanding that context and being questioning. Because in the end, you can produce anything. You know, any, any reasonably skilled person can produce decent graphics now. They can produce decent game designs because there are kit, there's kit out there that helps you do it. But why are you doing it? That's the key thing. So, you know, and that goes right back to things like this work here. Why am I doing this? Yes. Actually, it's because I recognize the culture in which it exists, and I'm pulling that apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's very, very interesting uh, that uh, the only way that you could apply something in, in contemporary education is by actually building a very different paradigm. Uh, yeah. which, is, which is fantastic. I mean, I, I, I've been to the school and it's, it's an incredible, incredible place. Um, how can we, what is the message that we could give uh, to all those people in education around the world and in England that uh, are not able to do this? What, what would you say for current contemporary education to do to improve um, the colleagues that are not able to just start. Uh, you want to, I mean, uh, for colleges or schools? For universities, yes. For, for higher for universities. education. Higher, for higher HE generally, further, yeah. further higher, higher education, education and further. Okay. Yeah. Well, in that case, uh, I hate to say it, but independence, mm. Mm. it's the single key thing. Now, you know, I, I get engaged in lots and lots of political shouting online. Mm. I love it. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, and I... That's, why not? I pretend it's a bar room. We've had a few drinks and I shout at people about politics. Who doesn't? And people go, oh, you must be, you know, left-wing socialist, commie, this, that, and the other. But actually, I believe in an independent education. Mm -hmm. You know, and I send my kids to an independent school and it's not so simple to me, this thing anymore, because I think we've gone through all that cycle mm -hmm. over the last 200 years. I think what we need to do now as we cycle back slightly is not to cycle back to the start, but actually cycle back in the development cycle but, and take the good things with us. And one of the things that the British system had that I think was exceptionally good was the way it dealt with art education Absolutely. historically. And if you go back to things like the Marion Richardson archive from 100 years ago, which funnily enough is in the Birmingham University I went to, she was sort of taught there how to teach. And Marion Richardson influenced hugely how art was taught in schools. But um, if you go back to that archive and you go back 100 years, you see that the art schools were very independent. And that even when I went to art college, 
there was a different choice at HE than there is now. There was a choice of going to universities to do proper research. There was a choice of going to polytechnics and institutes of higher education to do vocational work. And then there were the art schools Mm -hmm. sitting there on their own. The only other type of school I think that existed at the time that was separate were medical schools. (laughs) And they ran separately. Absolutely. uh, you know, everything the, goes through UCAS now. Unfortunately, at the, the time is, we had is, our own. Is the opposite. Yeah. Unfortunately, the trend now is complete unification, and that's and that's that's it. That's the big trouble. I mean, uh, art and design educators are being compared to nuclear scientists in 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 their publications and their doctorates. So there's uh, a a simple problem of value mm. in that if you want to adopt a managerial culture, and I say this as someone who's been a senior manager in big businesses. You have to be able to measure it and quantify it and put it on an account sheet, a balance sheet. And you can't necessarily do that with creative and cultural things. And I know that's a tired old trope that people trot out, but you really can't. I mean, look at the value I've added to the economy through having an art education. Mm -hmm. The value I've added has been through education and through emerging technology. Absolutely. You know, and I'm a classic art school graduate in that sense. So how did I get from one to the other? I got there because I was taught how to think. Mm -hmm. And that's something art schools in Britain in particular did. And because they were independent, you'd go along, you'd get given a studio, and you would work for three years in that studio and then go to lectures occasionally. And you were in an environment where it was all just what you were doing. There was none of this turn up for two hours lecture and then go home. You went to your studio. And then in the 90s, when the managerial culture kicked in and they were given the opportunity to become universities, they all soaked up all the local colleges. The art schools were folded into the polys. The polys became universities. And in Britain, in British terms, a university is is an organization that has to have a royal charter. And it has certain things it can and cannot do. And they have to be focused on research. So, of course, you lose all that heavyweight practice approach Mm. that you had with art, Mm. art schools. Mm. And so four or five years ago, when I worked for a major corporation, one of the jobs I had was to go around various uh, universities. And I met loads and loads of very unhappy creative techies. Mm. And I kept saying to them, if you're really that unhappy, get together, go out there, rent a building and found a college. Absolutely. And I think independence is the only way that you will break the logjam at the moment. I mean, not, not only that, but the view is that, first of all, uh, we had technicians, yeah? we had mm. professionals, yeah. professional designers, artists, we had theorists. They were set up like, PhDs, yeah. they were set up like yeah. classic studios that an artist would have had. Right now, you know, the Master Leonardo thing. Right now, all you have is research. That's what that's yep. left. So... So it's, we need to have a discussion now, and this is the point of all of the podcast, where, mm. where all this is going. It's because, because I've seen with my own eyes technicians leave and, and, and until there's nobody there. I've seen printmaking. Well, they leave, companies. and also the art staff that stay become very demoralized because exactly, exactly. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they could come into a job like that, and it was specifically so that they could carry on doing their practice. And the payoff was that they taught. Absolutely. And of course, when you've got a managerial culture in place, you can't do that. Because you start, they start saying, how many hours have you worked this week? And that's just not the way artists work. <laughs> you know, um, some of these paintings, you know, were started at three in the morning when I woke up terrified. Mm-hmm. 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 That's the way artists work. Of course. Now, of course. designers, admittedly, there's a little bit more structure to the day. But even there... You know, because they're constantly thinking about it and we're constantly trying things out, exactly. insight comes late exactly. at night. Exactly. You know? and, and you don't get that with a nine to six managerial structure. You Absolutely. just don't get it. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And you can incentivize people to a point by paying them well, but that's never going to happen. You know, it's just not because there are too many teachers and it's a huge amount of money. But what you can do is make the job a job where people can thrive personally. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that, that I think Mark's approach to the School of Communication Arts was right in that given the constraints of the modern economy, what Mark 
did and started doing and, and what we expanded on was getting mentors in. So, you know, there was in the end sort of possibly, I think, 600 mentors on a list somewhere at one point. And these people might spend an afternoon a year in there or, or a day a week or, you know, whatever. But the point is that enriched their job. And by seeing that that's the case, if you're going to hire somebody full time, you kind of need to enrich within the school. If you're hiring people to put, you know, to work in the school, you've got to make sure it is an enrichment activity for the teacher and not just a drain. You know, you wouldn't put a classical music composer in a, in a, in a classroom and say, mm. just teach and we're going to assess you. You'll never make any music again. But they expect that from visual artists indeed, and designers. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Whereas if you go in a place where they've got a music department, they're encouraged to have concerts. They're encouraged to, you know, do all that. And yes, they have the paperwork, but they do have concerts. Mm -hmm. Whereas the art and design schools have lost that exhibition culture, the, the real practice culture. Like you say, I don't know how to do this, go and see a technician. And the technician is a working artist paying for his own work or whatever. By doing the technician work, he's using the kit over there while he's helping you over here. You know, and, and that is how a studio was originally. I think what people need to do is get together and form literally independent institutes again as cooperatives almost. Right there... I, I, don't even write a curriculum. Just create a philosophy. You don't need a curriculum. You need a philosophy. Because, as I can prove with this work here, you can use computers, you can use, you know, or paint, and you can make art with anything. Mm -hmm. Right? You can do design on in any way. You can explore ideas on paper, on computers. It doesn't matter. The point is, if your philosophy is wrong, it will not thrive. And there's no room for philosophy in current yeah. Yeah. education, ultimately. This is... Sorry, it gets me wound no, up. No, this. no, it's, ab it's absolutely correct. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely the, the truth. Uh, how, how can we help uh, aspiring students uh, and graduates in this climate? Uh, mm. what, what would you say for them from an art and design perspective that they could actually... Uh, be uh, helpful for them to, to get into an industry? The best thing we could do as teachers is get them to turn up at nine o'clock on the first day and lock the door at five past nine and tell them they're not leaving till five o'clock and you'll do that every single day. And to, it's to cut this idea that you just come in for lectures and then go. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely entirely the wrong thing to do for artists. Mm -hmm. It cannot happen like that. You have to encourage a continual culture because you, you get the exchange of ideas because they bump into each other. They see what each other's working on. Um, you're around, you know, you, you know, a lot of lecturers now complain about the workload, but actually a lot of them avoid the classrooms <laughs> and the workrooms as much as possible. And they ought to be living in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and I think it's that. It's create that culture of you turn up in the morning and this is proper hard work. Yes, this is absolutely true. Uh, what about the ones that have left education? And, and ah, have a break the ones who have graduated, arts. again, hard work. Mm. I, I Honestly, I don't think... Um, I don't... I remember when I started my degree, we had a talk from the head of school who said, it's the only thing I can remember him saying, I can't even remember what he looked like. But he said, let's get one thing straight. When you graduate from here, you will not be an artist, but you will be ready to become one. Mm -hmm. And that, that spirit has also been lost, that the graduation point is the point that recognizes you've studied something, but studying is not being. And that being an artist is incredibly hard work. And being a designer is incredibly hard work. Being a musician, incredibly hard work. When you come out of those schools, you've got to be, you've got to understand that you're just starting. And I think this is the point. I think they come out and start. This actually goes back to selfie culture, doesn't it? Because you can immediately now display all the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about it, actually, you know, these kids are coming through and they're displaying everything about what they're doing online. 
as if they were a professional artist. And of course, they are if they're selling stuff. It might not be very good, but who's that? Who's to say what people buy? You know, that's up to them. Mm. But the point is that they are used to being able to exhibit and show things and build a profile. But even so, they are not being the professional by doing that. Mm. There's a lot more hard work needed. Uh, which golfer was it that said that? Um, Jack Nicholas. He was asked, you know, somebody said, Jack, you're a lucky golfer. And he said, you know, it's funny. The more I practice, the luckier I get. And I think some of that has been lost because I think things come through instantly now. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to build a public profile is what I'm trying to say, Absolutely. really. Absolutely. But actually being a good designer or artist or musician is a lot harder than that. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think it comes back to that behavior modification of locking the door at five past nine mm-hmm. on the first day. And this is why you need to go independent, because believe me, state schools won't let you lock the doors and keep students in. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, you have a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> but it is about behavior, and it's about yeah. understanding that modification ultimately and having a philosophy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can use any teaching tricks in the book after that, if you've got that. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, how can our viewers and listeners find you? Oh, how can they find me? They can find me on all social media streams, but the easiest way to get to me would be at my art website, mm. because there are links to all the social media things there, um, which is richardfadams.com. Uh, and that's probably the best way to go through, because that shows you the art behind me, and it talks about it. It's, there's, there's an about me and things like that on there. And there are links to Instagram and wherever else. So that's richardfadams.com. And I am absolutely happy to come and talk to people or talk to people, you know, via electronic means or whatever. Um, you know, the next project may well be another school, so I'm, I'm tossing that around Fantastic. at the moment. <laughs> Well, I was just thinking, of, I was just doing a, a short talk just to round up if, if, if that's where we're heading um, on Twitter. I've been doing during isolation short talks on Twitter um, yes. just because the work covers isolation yes. and things really. But today I was talking about sustainability, you know, and how sustainability was never part of an artist's life really to some extent, not as, neg- not as an upfront thing, but now it's in the 21st century, we've got to be much more aware of sustainability. And I think there are lots of things like that where we've got to start building philosophies that move us out of that 20th century mindset that was founded by the Bauhaus and people like that, because the Bauhaus was founded 101 years ago. It was at the height of the machine age. We are now at the point of artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Things need to change. Um, I think there's many, many more jobs for artists and designers with artificial intelligence than people think. Mm -hmm. Because uh, an artificial intelligence, when you work with AI and machine learning systems, what you realize is that they are not going to take over the world yet. They are not Terminator smart, Um, dumb. Compared to us, they are very dumb. And they need people to work with and the more creative people we put with them, the better the outputs will be. If you just put people with narrow outs- uh, mindsets with artificial intelligences, you get narrow outputs from the AI. If you put people with expansive educations and open minds and divergence, the AI can really start to grow. And I, I think there's a golden age if you change the philosophy of art and design education a bit. So how, please how, let's do it. <laughs> so how, how how can how can this be be more uh, done? Well, I think this is the point. I think you've got to change the fundamentals. How do you get to a point where you can teach that stuff? Well, you can't teach it on current structures. Mm-hmm. So you have to step out on your own. Now we are proving here that in the last few weeks we're recording this during coronavirus and the lockdowns. We can actually function distantly now, pretty easily. So there's no reason why we couldn't start to disseminate ideas and start to think about things differently in the same way. And this technology is only going to get better. Mm. Um, So you don't need a physical building even at the minute. Um, 
you know, it's nice to have that where you can get in and meet people because meeting people is still an experience that is better than not meeting them. But you don't need it constantly. And I think people have just got to take the initiative and stop getting down about the state of education and start looking at the possibilities. Mm-hmm. In fact, what they've got to do is what I've done on many occasions is got halfway through a painting, turn it against the wall, fed up with it, can't resolve it, start another one, but it, the next one's slightly further along the process. And I think it's time for one of those shifts. And the last major shift was about 100 years ago with the Bauhaus. Now, that's not saying those philosophies are wrong and tired, whatever, but we're in a different era. And context is everything with culture. You know, culture doesn't really exist without a context, clearly. Mm -hmm. And if we're living in an era where we are talking, you know, with, with clever machines, how do we very cleverly operate those machines? We need people who can think creatively and be creative. And that could be a designer, musician, an artist. It could be a physicist. Those old disciplines, in a way, don't matter. It's the creativity and the approach to things that matters. And I, I think people have just got to get up and do it. I think, I think um, a bottom-up revolution is needed, but I also think that some, in some ways the education sector and the people in it are too ground down to be able to do that at the moment. Mm. I don't know if they've got the energy left. But, you know, all those original art schools were founded by people. Of course. So it's been done before. You know, this is one of the, the woman who phoned me up to berate me about the college started going on at me. You can't just start a college, she said. And I said, yes, you can. And she said, no, you can't. I said, well, how do you think they started in the first place? She said, the council, the local councils made them. I said, no, they didn't. Most, they took them over. They were already existing, most of them. Some of them, yes, but not all of them. You know, and there's me, a graduate of art schools that had been there 150 years that clearly weren't council art schools, you know. So I think I think you've got all that to unpick. You've got that horrible managerial culture to get rid of. But there must be enough people out there who can say, here's a complex system, which is this econ- economy and ecology we're working in. If we change the inputs on that complex system, what will emerge? And that's really what I'm talking about, systems thinking on how you... The, the, uh, yeah. the, the issue... You know, how you change the, things. The issue where Black Mountain College at the Bauhaus stumbled eventually was, was the, fund, the funding. Uh, mm. And uh, there are some attempts by people towards that direction. Uh, I think they stumble at the uh, funding level. They do, but then don't think that it will last forever. Mm-hmm. You see, if you go into that... Uh, knowing that at some point you will struggle with the funding, then make sure what you are doing has got a fixed time limit on it. So um, when you start a business, often you start to look for money to invest and you put a time limit on the business from that point. And you say, okay, we've got an exit in three years or five years. And I think people need to set up things like that and they need to be fast and then reestablish afterwards Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the newness wears off. And it becomes more difficult because you become establishment. And unless at that, that's at the point where you've either got to scale up or stop it and start again. And I think people need to start doing that. And that's, again, how artists and designers work. Of course, of course, of course. We start and stop and we refresh and we renew. We don't expect it to go on forever, but yet with art schools, we do. You know, but I think this managerial thing's had its day. I mean, in the UK, it's 30 years now, that culture, uh, which is a whole generation, you know, and and, um, the managerial culture needs to go. Hmm. It's hurting the culture of the country. Most definitely. Well, I think you you even touched on the last point, unless you uh, have any last piece of... uh... Uh, if you'd like to add something more than those spectacular conclusions? I, uh, yeah, I just think, you know what? Go back and examine your own philosophy is my advice to anybody. Mm. Look at what philosophy is actually behind what you're doing. Not the pedagogy, not the practice, the philosophy. What is it you're actually trying to do, you know? And if your philosophy doesn't match what you're being enabled, what you're being allowed to do, then change the conditions in which you're working. And that might mean working on your own. 
absolutely. You know, and that's a big step. But actually, there are many more like-minded individuals out there who you just don't know yet. And that, that's my advice to listeners. Is it easy? Of course it isn't. It's really hard. <laughs> that's, but without that underlying philosophy and that shift and that understanding of what's coming and the willingness to try new things, you know, if you're not willing to do any of that, then you're not really an artist or designer anyway. Absolutely. You know, and you should question what you're teaching <laughs> because art and design should constantly evolve uh, because what we make constantly evolves. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, which is fantastic. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk about this stuff. Uh, I wouldn't mind being in government. I don't think I'd get in with my track record. <laughs> Take care. See you soon. Thank you. All the best. Bye.